Having published several standard textbooks in anesthesiology and over 200 scientific papers, no wonder that I am often asked to consult as a medical legal expert. I do not take on all cases that I am asked to consult on, instead I pick and choose only the ones that I can learn something from and use what I learn in making recommendations for safer medical practice. One of my colleagues, also a medical legal expert who is both a doctor and an attorney, recently voiced a concern that he has seen an increasing number of medical legal cases and lawsuits involving regional anesthesia. Now, I don't think that regional anesthesia carries higher risk of complications than general anesthesia, even with regards to the risk of nerve injury. However, being that Regional anesthesia is becoming standard of care in many institutions as a part of ERAS programs and multimodal postoperative pain protocols. The complications in regional anesthesia, just like in medicine at large, is a function of the number of procedures. Meaning, the more procedures violating skin integrity are being done, being the nerve blocks or surgical procedures, the higher the number of complications. However, this doesn't mean that regional anesthesia has higher risk of complications than GA. It simply means that the more nerve blocks you do, the higher the chance that you will have a complication. Although the risk is very low, likely 1 in 3,000 or 1 in 4,000, it is simply a number game. The question, however, is how to further decrease the risk to the point at which you may never see a complication in your own practice. In reviewing the medical legal cases in which practitioners are being sued over nerve injury that potentially resulted from regional anesthesia, I have identified several patterns, practice patterns, that lead to higher risk for both neurologic complications and a higher risk of being named in a lawsuit. In cases of nerve injury that may be related to nerve blocks, it is often the lack of monitoring and documentation that exposes the practitioners to the risk of being sued, and more importantly, possibly expose the patient to an injury. Since NYSORA is one of the most prominent teaching organizations in regional anesthesia, I often see images and illustrations from NYSORA's NORBLAC app, NORBLAC manual, or the compendium of regional anesthesia that are included or copied in the legal documents. However, it is really interesting to see from these documents the lack of understanding of the whole picture and how the combination of existing and ubiquitously available monitoring can be beneficial but is not being used in avoiding these complications and lawsuits. Let's take a look at the PENG block or pericapsular nerve group infiltration block. As the PENG block is increasingly more often being used for the purpose of analgesia after total hip replacement, we also see an increase in incidence of femoral nerve injury. In one occurrence I reviewed, the practitioners who were involved in the case adamantly claimed that femoral nerve injury in their PENG case could not have been possibly caused by the PENG block because PENG block procedure has nothing to do with the femoral nerve. While this is true, the involved practitioners are completely disregarding the fact that a very minor error in the needle insertion angle can easily lead to the needle path toward the femoral nerve. So let's review this. That's the anterior inferior iliac spine. This is the pubic ramus here. Now what we see here, this is the tendon of the iliosaurus muscle and our intended injection should be just behind the muscle to block the small little branches of the femoral nerve. However, here you can see the femoral artery and right next to it is a femoral nerve. And you can see how a small error in the needle direction can lead you to the femoral nerve. And therefore, femoral nerve can be easily exposed and at risk during the pain block procedure. Let's watch this loop on a video and you will see how it is actually possible to injure the femoral nerve during the pain procedure. Many practitioners have completely abandoned any other monitoring methods but visual 
ultrasound. However, it is easy to see how using nerve stimulation as a safety monitor can contribute useful safety information of benefits to both patients and the rigors of accurate and objective medical legal documentation. Although not using nerve stimulation during ultrasound-guided nerve blocks does not comprise violation of standards of care, simply because the standards of care in regional anesthesia have never been established. But the documentation that states that the cordyceps motor response was absent during the pain block assures everyone involved that the practitioner has invested additional objective monetary methods and efforts to prevent femoral nerve injury during the pain block. If you find Nasora videos useful, subscribe to our channel and never miss the future videos.